Let's chat about the physical properties of metals. So physical properties of the, are those that can be measured without applying a force to the material. Now, this is in comparison to mechanical properties, which we'll talk about in another chapter, where you do apply force to the material and see how it reacts. So the first physical property we'll talk about is density. Density is the weight per unit volume. Now there's something called a theoretical density, which is a measure of the atomic mass and the unit cell dimensions. So if you look at a periodic table and you go from the top left to the right, as you move across, the atoms will have more protons, neutrons, and electrons from left to right, and then from top to bottom. So theoretically, the bottom most right element will be the heaviest, the most dense. Now, that's not the only factor that comes into play because these atoms have to arrange themselves in a material. So you can have atoms that are very dense, but if they're spread out in unit cells, then the actual material won't be very dense. So this is really beyond what we care about. We're gonna look at uh, materials and alloys in the commercial business, right? So we're gonna look at steel, cast iron, forgings versus castings, not necessarily the theoretical weight of lead or uranium or, or iron. So iron and steel densities can be changed by processing and composition. So a casting will typically be less dense than a forging. Now, if you think about it, you take a casting, you pour hot metal in a mold, it cools down. A forging, you'll take that same metal and hit it with hammers and physically crush it down to a smaller size. Therefore, the forging will be more dense than a casting. Cast iron will be less dense than regular steel because there's more carbon in the cast iron. Carbon weighs less than iron, therefore it's less dense. The next, we're gonna talk about the thermal properties of metals. So the thermal properties are the measurements of a metal's reaction to heat. The specific heat capacity is the heat input required to raise the temperature of a material a unit mass of material by one degree. So this is measured in BTUs per pound times degrees Fahrenheit. So how much heat do you need to add to get it up one degree? This is useful in determining the furnace input to heat material. So if you work at a big foundry, you need to know how much fuel you need to burn to get those BTUs to raise the temperature of a certain amount of metal to whatever temperature you need, specific heat is a way to do that. And every different kind of metal will have a different specific heat. So aluminum is different from iron, which is different from stainless steel, etc. The next is thermal expansion. So metals expand when they're exposed to heat and contract when they're cooled. So this matters when you're machining or welding or making parts and inspecting them because according to the ASME and the ISO standards, measurements are to take place at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So the smaller the part, the less this matters, okay? So if you have a one inch cube and it expands by, you know, uh, one micro inch, it's really not noticeable. But if you have a girder that's 50 feet long and it expands by one micro inch per inch, it might grow, you know, a quarter inch or something. It depends what the coefficient of thermal expansion is for that material. So when you make something in a shop, if it's 100 degrees in the shop, that material is going to be bigger than it should be for inspection. Now there's a pretty simple equation for this and every material has its own uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. So this can be figured out and modern CMM machines can be programmed to compensate for this automatically. So if a metal is heated in a free state, so it's heated evenly and allowed to cool down evenly, it'll expand and contract and then it'll end up being the same size that it was. If 
the metal was heated or cooled unevenly, so say you put a, a brick of metal in an oven and you put the bottom on a fire brick, that bottom side isn't going to heat up as much as the top. When you go to cool it down, it'll tend to warp. Same thing when you quench material. If you quench one side before the other, you're gonna get deformation and warping. So the coefficient of thermal expansion is the fractional change in length for each unit change in temperature. So the units are in micro inch per inch per degree Fahrenheit. So we can apply it to any length of material and just apply, you know, factor in the change in heat. The next item is thermal conductivity. So this is the ability of a metal to conduct heat. Silver, copper, aluminum, gold, all conduct heat extremely well. And basically anything that conducts heat well will also conduct electricity very, very well. These metals are often used for electronics or heat exchangers. So a heat exchanger is used to transfer heat from a liquid to a liquid, a liquid to air, air to a liquid. It's helpful to have a metal that can move the heat through it fairly quickly. The next is the melting point of a metal. So only laboratory pure metals melt at a single temperature. What that means is if you take a laboratory pure 100% iron, it'll melt at one temperature. It'll go from solid to liquid in a matter of moments. But commercial metals are almost never pure. There's always a mixture of different stuff in that alloy. In this case, they're not going to melt or solidify at a single temperature. There's always gonna be a range of temperatures. So what occurs, say you have a molten metal, steel, like we've talked about before, as it solidifies, you're gonna get crystals form while the rest of the metal is in liquid state, right? So this is sometimes called the slushy phase. Now we can figure out how long this flush, slushy stage will take. Say it goes from 2000 degrees to 1800 degrees and below that you'll have solid metal. We can track this later on in this series of lectures with our iron carbon diagram. The next item is our heat of fusion. So to melt metal, we know we have to add a certain amount of thermal energy to make that metal melt all the way through. We can measure this in BTUs per pound. Again, this is another uh, thing we can look up when we're trying to figure out how much fuel we need for a furnace to melt a metal. The next property are our electrical properties. So metals that are good conductors of heat, as we discussed before, also conduct electricity very well. So silver, copper, and aluminum, in that order, conduct electricity extremely well. The next are our magnetic properties. So ferromagnetism is the physical property at the atomic level that causes certain materials to become magnets or be attracted to magnets. So three metal elements exhibit ferromagnetism at room temperature, iron, nickel, and cobalt. Some alloys can become magnetic, including the rare earth metals, through alloying processes. And one more note, there's something called a Curry temperature for irons and steels. If you heat iron or steel past a certain temperature, it loses its magnetism until it cools back down to room temperature. Next item is joinability. So this one can be a little subjective, but there have been whole books written about it. We got a pretty good idea about what kinds of metals can be joined and how to effectively do that. So joinability is the ease or difficulty of attaching two pieces of metal by welding, brazing, or soldering. So some metals are nearly impossible to weld, but they can be brazed or soldered very effectively. So think about the copper pipe in your home. It's not welded, it's soldered. Now it is possible to weld copper, but it's much more efficient and just about as good to solder it to get a good joint. So weldability is the ability of a metal to be welded. So what exactly is welding? 
Welding involves a melting of the base metal and either the use or not the use of a filler metal. So welding is always going to require more heat input than the next two things we'll talk about, brazing and soldering. Another thing about welding, when you melt that base metal, it's going to have to cool, right? You've applied a lot of heat into a small area and melted the metal. So just like a uh, casting, cooling down, and solidifying, that weld puddle will have to solidify. You're typically going to get a range of grain sizes from the center of the weld through the heat affected zone. Now in some metals, that's no big deal. A typical carbon steel won't really lose any strength or anything. It welds up just fine. But some metals, like 6061 aluminum or stainless steels or high carbon steel, can lose a lot of strength and become embrittled at the weld joint if proper heating and cooling is not observed. So it's just something to keep an eye on. If you ever have to weld anything other than regular carbon steel, it's worth looking up to see if that heat from the weld is gonna cause problems in that weld area. So to avoid some of the problems of welding, brazing and soldering are often used. Brazing and soldering are similar to welding, but neither of them melt the base metal. Brazing and soldering both use a filler metal and typically use a flux to keep the weld metal or the joint clean. Now, when you don't melt that base metal, you're applying the filler metal to it, melting it, and it essentially acts like a metal glue, but it does form a metallic bond visible under a microscope. So it's not quite the same thing as glue. Now the difference between soldering and brazing is the temperature. So the AWS American Welding Society says anything done over 800 degrees is brazing, anything under 800 degrees is soldering. Now brazing and soldering typically use different filler metals. A very common filler metal for brazing is low fuming bronze, which is 60% copper, 40% zinc, a common filler metal for solder is lead tin. They can both be used in plumbing applications, sometimes in electronics. Soldering is prized for electronics because of the low heat input. The next topic is machinability. So the machinability is the ease or difficulty of cutting metal compared to a standard alloy. Now this is somewhat difficult to quantify. I mean, there's been whole books written about it. We can basically say that some metals are more difficult to machine than a standard steel. It depends on a lot of things though. What kind of tooling you have available, what kind of lubrication, cooling, everything for your process. So let's chat about the chemical properties of metals. The first is corrosion. So when metals are exposed to oxygen, they tend to pick up that oxygen and form an oxide layer. But for example, aluminum, even though aluminum doesn't rust, it does oxidize. So the outer skin of aluminum will be kind of dull looking, right? This is the aluminum alloy mixing with oxygen and forming a really thin layer all the way around the metal, anything that's exposed to oxygen. Now this really only matters when you're welding, you have to get rid of that layer, but what it also does is protect the aluminum from further attack. Now iron and steel do this as well. The problem is iron oxide, it, you know, that red stuff, well, we commonly call it rust, flakes away where aluminum oxide doesn't. Aluminum oxide sticks to the surface very well. Iron oxide will flake away, exposing the steel or iron to more attack by oxygen. So it is a far more dangerous kind of thing than aluminum oxide. But other metals like titanium also develop an oxide layer that protects the metal from further attack. The corrosion resistance is the ability of a metal to remain in the metallic condition. So some things like gold and silver are extremely corrosion resistant, whereas iron is not as corrosion resistant. So let's chat about galvanic corrosion. 
galvanic corrosion results when dissimilar metals are combined in an electrolytic solution. One metal will tend to corrode. Now this is a problem in the marine industry, so boats and docks and things have to have what's called a sacrificial anode if there's multiple metals being used that are touching the water. So the sacrificial anode, typically made out of zinc, will absorb the negative impacts from the galvanic corrosion as current moves from one of the metals to the other through the electrolyte. High temperature oxidation is an, a phenomena that occurs to steel when it's heated above about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. What happens is the red hot metal combines with the oxygen very, very quickly. So much more quickly than rusting in open air at room temperature. It forms a black scale, I've mentioned it before, mill scale. It's known as magnetite, mill scale, iron oxide. It depends how thick the metal as to how thick the mill scale will be, but this is common in hot rolled metals and metals that are put in an oven that don't have an inert atmosphere, so just a regular air atmosphere. So when uh, like a cold rolled steel is being heat treated and you want to keep that bright finish, you have to fill the oven up with argon or a vacuum or some other inert gas to keep the oxygen out of there, otherwise you'll develop this mill scale from high temperature oxidation. And the last bit is electrolysis. This is a property of metals that makes batteries possible. So similar to galvanic corrosion, if you put two extremely electronegative metals in an electrolyte, you'll get current. This is the basis of lead acid and lithium ion batteries. We use metals for this purpose, nothing else will do. So that's it for chapter five, physical and chemical properties of metals. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. This video is part of a course in the Advanced Manufacturing Technology Program at Hudson Valley Community College. We have plenty of courses online, including this one. If you are interested in continuing your education, please go to hvcc.edu and see what might be available for you.